for Dr. Cruz's talk. Um, Dr. Cruz's has a breadth of experience um, with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, um, as a laboratory fellow emeritus currently, um, and previously in several director positions uh, with Pacific Northwest and other university entities. Uh, he'll be talking to us today about helium-3 and nuclear safeguards, specifically nuclear safeguards and the helium-3 problem. So thank you so much, Dr. Cruz, for joining. And uh, we look forward to hearing your talk. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Appreciate uh, being able to give a talk. And sorry, it's not in person. I was just out there a few weeks ago. So um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about nuclear safeguards and the helium-3 problem. So let's see if I can advance the slides. There's a, there we go. OK. Um, First, let me point out, as you know, uh, this is being sponsored as this distinguished lecture by the IEEE Nuclear and Plasma Sciences Society. Um, the IEEE is made up of 38 technical societies. The NPSS is one of those, and we span a broad set of areas as listed there, uh, including radiation instrumentation, which is really the field that I'm in. Uh, the main activities of the NPSS are to sponsor conferences. We sponsor about seven conferences a year covering these areas of uh, our interest. Uh, and in particular, the Nuclear Science Symposium is the Radiation Instrumentation and Medical Imaging Conference held each year. This year, it's in Vancouver, Washington. Uh, so perhaps some of you will be able to attend that. Um, as uh, Flynn mentioned, I'm I've been uh, at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory for the last several years. Uh, and uh, we are located in Eastern Washington. Let me see if I can get a pointer on here. I think there's a pointer, this laser pointer, there we go. So PNNL is in Eastern Washington, uh, one of the many national labs that you see shown here on the map run uh, by the Department of Energy. Uh, PNNL is, uh, this is a bird's eye view showing the laboratory campus. It's a very open campus, much like a university. I don't know if any of you ever have uh, visited PNNL or not, but uh, we're located on the Columbia River, which is the second largest river in the United States. Uh, we're north of Richland, Washington. Uh, about 5,000 staff members and about a billion dollar a year budget uh, for the laboratory. Laboratory does all sorts of science and technology, basically every everything, uh, including a large uh, group that does radiation detection and safeguards and nonproliferation. I want to say a few words about my background, how I got here. Uh, I started out as an undergraduate and then graduate student working in nuclear spectroscopy. Uh, that led me into work in uh, data acquisition to develop uh, data taking for experiments that which eventually led me into collaborative computing uh, and which we finally seen to fruition here during the, the pandemic. But meanwhile, the in the science area, uh, that led me to working on solar neutrinos, the solar neutrino problem, which existed back in the 80s. Uh, and that got me involved in two solar neutrino experiments, SAGE, the Soviet American gallium experiment, which, uh, is located in, under Mount Elbrus in southern Russia. And the second one was SNOW, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, which is a large heavy water detector. Um, and the leader of SNOW won the Nobel Prize because this experiment showed definitively that uh, neutrinos uh, oscillate. Uh, involvement in SNOW led me into involvement in further neutrino experiments, Majorana, the neutrinoless double beta decay experiment, which we started at PNNL in 1999, which finally wrapped up the experiment last year. So that experiment took about 22, 23 years to complete, uh, which is typical of large uh, physics experiments. And from that, it spun off into some work in carbon sequestration, looking at muons. And that has led me into my most recent project, which is in archaeology of uh, the pyramids using muons. Meanwhile, Going back to spectroscopy, that led me into work at PNNL in nonproliferation, which got me into safeguards, and also at the same time got me into border security work, 
um, where I spent, you know, quite a quite a number of years at PNL working on border security as well as uh, nonproliferation and safeguards. So a very convoluted sort of path here. Um, so let me turn to nuclear safeguards. Uh, nuclear safeguards are there to ensure that nuclear material remains under a nation's control. Uh, the IEA uh, safeguards specifically say an extensive set of technical measures by which the IAEA secretariat independently verifies the correctness and completeness of a declaration made by a state about their nuclear material and activities. So this is for states that are members and agree to the safeguards provided by the International Atomic Interagency, Energy Agency, sorry. Uh, specifically, the IEA monitors uh, declared facilities, which include enrichment plants, fuel fabrication plants, power reactors, and storage facilities for spent fuel, and reprocessing plants. So the methods that the IEA uses for safeguards include, include containment and surveillance, remote monitoring, non-destructive analysis, destructive analysis, and environmental sampling. In particular, they measure the presence of plutonium and highly enriched uranium and the enrichments of those materials. And, are to, and to be sure these materials are in the places they're supposed to be and in the quantities as declared. So gamma rays are used for uh, verifying the isotopics of these materials, the isotopic enrichments. And then there's a large variety of neutron detectors that are used to observe the fission from plutonium and highly enriched uranium. Uh, let me remind you that the IEA considers a significant quantity to be eight kilograms of plutonium-239, or 25 kilograms of highly enriched uranium. So as you're, I think you're all familiar with uh, high purity of germanium detectors that are used for making gamma ray measurements. Here's a spectrum of uh, background with many, many lines extending up to several MeV. Uh, and of course, for, for the isotopics associated with plutonium and highly enriched uranium, you're typically looking at low energies, things below 600 keV in energy are where the prominent lines are that identify plutonium and uh, highly enriched uh, uranium uh, isotopes. And then the IEA looks at neutrons. Here are the energy spectra of several neutron sources. In particular, the dark line here is the energy spectrum from a fizzle, a fissile, a fission source, rather. Um, it's characterized by a broad energy peak, peaking around two to three MeV. And there are several neutrons, three, four, or more neutrons that come out in a single fission event. This fission spectrum, this is Californium, but plutonium uh, and uranium fission look very similar. This can be compared to other sources of neutrons, uh, such as AMLI, which is a low energy source, I mean, americium lithium source, or plutonium oxide, which again is a low energy neutron source, or plutonium beryllium and uh, americium beryllium, which are higher energy neutron sources. So these other sources in principle might be used by a country to attempt a spoof if they have moved plutonium or, or highly enriched uranium. Um, and you might try to create a source that is a spoof of fissile material, special nuclear material. So to detect neutrons, there's a number of detectors that are used. Here are a couple of examples. Um, the energy of the neutrons is not unique to SNM. Uh, but as we saw, there are some lower energy sources and higher energy sources. Um, the backgrounds that are present for neutrons come from uh, cosmic rays. So protons and, and uh, helium slam into the atmosphere. They produce pions, which produce muons, and also at the same time, neutrons are produced. Uh, some of those neutrons reach the surface of the Earth. 
uh, and produce a background in neutron detectors. Um, shown here in the middle is a large uh, neutron detector inside this uh, moderator box are several helium-3 tubes. This is about six feet tall. And a background rate inside this very large neutron detector is only about two counts a second. So the neutrons at the surface of the Earth from background are pretty low. So the presence of a neutron source is pretty easily detected against that background. Um, shown here is a helium-3 tube. It's just a, a long uh, two-inch tube. And a Bonner sphere is a, a very commonly used neutron detector, uh, which you've probably observed uh, around your laboratory. There are typically three materials used for neutron detection, helium-3 being the most prominent, lithium-6 and boron-10 are two other isotopes that might be used for neutron detection. And we'll talk about how they are used. So looking at helium-3, Helium-3 is the gold standard for neutron detection. It's been used for 50 years or more. Uh, the reaction is a helium-3 absorbs a neutron at thermal energies typically, splits up into a proton and a triton and 764 keV of energy. The cross-section of helium-3 is very large and it exponentially decreases with energy. So it, it's very large at cross-section at thermal energies falling down at epithermal energies and out to, to fast neutrons, uh, it's down by several orders of magnitude. On the right here is shown the pulse height spectrum inside of a helium-3 proportional counter. Um, this peak here at the end is the full deposition of the 764 keV of energy into that tube. And the rest of the structure that's down here is called the wall effect. It's due to the fact that either the proton or the triton hit the wall of the counter before depositing all of their energy into the tube. And so what you like to see is this nice peak out here, but you do have this wall effect, which decreases uh, the energy deposited. But still this peak is well, or this structure is well separated from the background. The, down here at very low end pulse height is uh, the background from gamma rays typically. So one can set a discriminator in this gap here and get very good response uh, to neutrons only. So let me talk some about applications of helium-3, of which there are several. The largest use of helium-3 uh, has historically been uh, neutron science. Places like the Spallation Neutron Source at Oak Ridge uses large collections of helium-3 tubes. Here's This is actually a room at the ILL in France. Um, or is it Switzerland? Anyway, uh, these are helium-3 tubes, and this is where in a room where a target is hit by thermal neutrons, and the neutrons are scattered and detected in these helium-3 counters. So you can see why neutron spallation sources tend to use a lot of helium-3. Um, uh, there's about 120,000 liters needed uh, through 2015 for building the, the spallation neutron source at Oak Ridge, so a very large quantity of gas. These facilities look at all sorts of uh, effects from scattering. They look at structural biology, chemistry, materials, polymers, superconductors, and so forth. Um, and in a, in a facility like SNS, there are several experimental rooms where work is done. The second largest use of helium-3 has been for national security, mostly for homeland security, uh, shown here on the bottom right. This is uh, San Ysidro, the border crossing near San Diego, where there are shown here 32 lanes of traffic entering the United States. And every vehicle goes through one of these portal monitors. And inside these portal monitors are a large gamma ray detector and a large neutron detector. Uh, in addition to the border security applications, there are also safeguards applications, which we'll talk about. Uh, there are handheld neutron detectors shown here on the left and large detectors such as this uh, coincidence counter from Los Alamos. Another application for helium-3 has been in well logging. In this situation, a neutron source is inside of a, uh, a tube put into a borehole 
along with some helium-3 detectors. And what's looked for is a reflection off of hydrogenous material in the surrounding uh, well hole uh, in order to explore for oil and gas. Um, this is, a you know, compared to, to neutron scattering science, this is a small use, 2,000 liters a year of uh, helium-3. But as we'll see, that's not necessarily insignificant in terms of supply. Another application is construction, shown here is what's called a Troxler gauge. It's a instrument used in construction. Inside is a gamma ray source and a neutron source. And again, what's looked for here is the dryness of the soil or the concrete that it's being used on, looking at neutron reflection off of the water inside of the concrete or soil. And about 1,200 liters a year go into that application. These instruments are, are used very commonly. They're actually just thrown into the back of pickup trucks and driven back and forth across the border all the time. Another application which uh, historically used only about 3,000 liters a year of, of helium-3 has been uh, cryogenic cooling. Uh, this dilution refrigerator, which uses a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4, is the only way to produce a sustainable millikelvin temperature. And like I said, historically, this hasn't been a large use, but we're going to come back to that a little bit later. Another application uh, which has been looked at is using helium-3 for ma magnetic resonance imaging uh, of the lungs in particular. So uh, MRI of the lungs using helium-3 can reveal uh, tumors that can't otherwise be seen. And finally, there's the future potential of fusion, should fusion ever be proved uh, feasible. Uh, once you get past the DT and DD fusion that would be undoubtedly the initial type of fusion used, uh, you could get to a cleaner cycle, the D-helium-3 cycle, uh, which does not produce neutrons. So it's, uh, it's a much lower radioactivity uh, even though fusion in general is low activity, it's a much lower activity uh, form of fusion, but it does require higher temperatures. So we're looking a ways out in time. Um, but for such a, an application, you would need very large amounts, like a million liters a year of helium-3 to do this type of reaction. So you have to find a, a new large source. And this is what's led to the proposal to do mining of helium-3 on the surface of the moon the solar wind has driven helium-3 into the, the lunar soil that's captured there. And uh, computations show there should be a very large reservoir on the moon. Uh, so in principle, it could be mined. Uh, if you've seen the movie Moon or the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, both of those uh, take place during helium-3 mining operations on the moon. At the beginning of 2001, A Space Odyssey, you may remember they find this large monolith on the moon. And uh, they find the monolith because they're mining for helium-3. So now let me turn to how neutron detection is used for safeguards. Um, the main application is gross neutron counting. That is, just the presence of neutron neutrons is an indication that there's material of interest there. And that's uh, what the IEA uses uh, largely. The second instrument that's used is coincidence counter. A coincidence counter measures singles and doubles neutrons. That is, it can look for coincidence neutrons, which would be more characteristic of, of a fission uh, than from an AMBI or a PUB source, for example. Um, the third type of instrument is the multiplicity counter. And this is an even larger instrument that measures what are called singles, doubles, and triples. So it can look at single neutrons, coincident neutrons, and triple coincidence events. And if you can do those three measurements, then from that, you can determine three, three important properties of the material you're looking at. First, you can determine the mass, the mass of fissile material that's present. You can determine the multiplication, that is, for every neutron emitted in a fission, it tends to induce another fission in the material, which is very dependent on the geometry of the material. So uh, you might produce more neutrons, and that factor is called the multiplication. Uh, and the third parameter is the alpha N reaction. Uh, alpha decays within the material can induce neutrons. 
uh, and those neutrons produce a background against the fission neutrons. So if you can do a multiplicity detector where you measure singles, doubles, and triples, you can deconvolute these three parameters and very carefully characterize whatever that object is you're looking at and give you great confidence about the fact that it is a fissile material in a certain shape. So here's an example of one of the detectors that's used by the IEA to look at spent fuel. What you see here is a fork detector. It measures gross neutron counts. It just consists of helium-3 tubes inside of this fork-shaped object. And you see in the inlay here that uh, the fork detector is underwater looking at a spent fuel material, just counting the neutrons coming from it. So uh, this is a way to uh, assay and verify the spent fuel burnup of that uh, spent fuel. And so that's a typical measurement that might be done by an IAE inspector at a reactor site. The second instrument I wanted to mention was one that uh, has very recently come to my attention being uh, built by the IAEA in the last few years. Uh, these I have two slides here that came from Tim White. Tim White's a PNNL staff member who spent six years on loan to the IEA from PNNL. Uh, and he worked on this instrument called the Passive Gamma Emission Tomography uh, Instrument. Uh, it's designed to measure both gamma rays and neutrons. So it measures gross neutrons using boron 10 counters, not helium-3, and gamma rays using uh, CZT, uh, cadmium zinc tulsa uh, tungstide uh, gamma ray detector. It's a medium resolution spectrometry, but it does do a tomographic image by rotation, and I'll show you that in a second. So here's a picture of the, the PGET inside a, a, a water storage uh, pool at a reactor site with a spent fuel assembly being passed through the PGET. And so in this way, much more careful measurement uh, can be made of this fuel, uh, not just gross neutrons, but gross neutrons and gamma rays. Um, so it takes about five minutes to do a measurement and then another minute or so to do the analysis on this. Uh, so this video here shows the uh, PGET with the cover taken off. And what you see is it actually rotates around the fuel assembly and can do a three-dimensional reconstruction of which fuel elements are present and which ones are not. Uh, I, didn't show, I didn't show you this, the picture that results from this, but that's what it does. It rotates around. There's, here's one of the boron detectors here and one on the other side for the neutrons, and the gamma ray detectors are in these other assemblies. Um, it took several years to, for the IEA to develop this uh, instrument. Then once it rotates, it rotates back to its uh, previous position. So another instrument that's used, uh, historically been used, is the coincidence counter. I mentioned the coincidence counter measures uh, singles and doubles. Um, shown here is what's called an uncle, a uranium neutron coincidence collar. Uh, in this blue area here uh, are a whole series of helium-3 tubes and this surrounds a fresh fuel assembly. This is typically used for fresh fuel, not spent fuel. Uh, this uncle can be operated in two modes, either passive or active. What's shown here in this configuration is actually an active system. An AMLI source is placed inside of this little side uh, assembly here and subjects to the fuel assembly, uh, subjects new, uh, to neutron exposure. Those neutrons induce fission, which are then measured by the coincidence counters inside this blue box here. And, and the white here is polyethylene moderator uh, because helium-3 absorbs the uh, thermal neutrons much more efficiently. So um, this can be used to verify, for example, the uranium-235 enrichment in uranium fuel. It takes about 15 minutes to do a 1% measurement. So if you're an IAEA inspector, you may only be able to do you know, a few maybe at most 10 of these measurements a day uh, at, an, at a facility looking at for uh, the enrichment in fuel. So now let me turn to the helium-3 problem. 
So healing, the Healing 3 supply that we have comes entirely from the uh, production that was done for nuclear weapons. Tritium was made uh, in nuclear reactors uh, to be used to make hydrogen bombs. Over time, over a half life of 12.4 years, that trit tritium decays to helium-3. So on a fairly frequent basis, the tritium has to be purified to remove the helium-3. And that's done at Savannah River site in uh, Carolina. Uh, and that tritium is then uh, stored, at, put back into to weapons or into the supply for weapons. And the helium-3 is put into a stockpile uh, controlled by the Department of Energy. Uh, the production of tritium ceased in about 1988 in the United States um, because all the need for weapons had been met. Uh, over the last few years, there's been a uh, re restart of tritium production on a very small scale, I should say, in the Watts Bar reactors in Tennessee. So these are commercial power reactors that are producing small quantities of tritium to help with the uh, supply for weapons. Um, the, the total decay from the stockpile of tritium in the U.S. produces about 8,000 liters a year of helium-3. So if you may recall back to the application of the helium-3, we talked about, you know, we said that, okay, a couple thousand went into this, a couple thousand went into that. So you can see 8,000 a year is not really that much compared to what the demand is. The only other supplier in the world of helium-3 is Russia, uh, for the same reason the U.S. Uh, provides helium-3. Shown here on the right, are some helium-3 tubes inside a moderator with the cover taken off in a large neutron detector. So as I said, the largest use of helium-3 has historically been for neutron scattering science and national security. Uh, and they are what drove up the demand for helium-3 in the early 2000s. Um, the supply of helium-3 from Russia and the US total is about 10 to 20,000 liters a year. Whereas the demand for helium-3 in 2007 reached 65,000 liters per year. So that is what caused what's called the helium-3 problem. The fact that the demand went way above the supply. Um, helium-3 in the US is distributed by the Department of Energy Office of Science Office of Isotope Programs. It, isotope Programs used to be part of the Office of Nuclear Physics. It's now a separate office within the Department of Science, Office of Science. Um, so it says here, DOE is relying on industry or the international community to develop a new supply of helium-3. That was sort of where things were in 2008. So I'm going to show you a little bit of a historic progression. So in 2009, here's what DOE was saying. The dotted line here is the yearly supply of helium-3, somewhere below 20,000 liters per year. Here was where the helium-3 went to over those years in the, you know, in, uh, the early 2000s, a lot of it to detection. And here in, 20, in FY18 was the large demand to, to uh, provide helium for the second half of the spallation neutron source. So there was a huge demand there. So again, this was the projection and DOE and everybody else in the US government were fretting over what they were gonna do about this problem. So by 2010, the government put together a committee, an intergovernment agency to look at this problem. And they came up with three actions. They said, we're going to reduce demand, we're going to manage the demand, and we're going to increase the supply. Um, and I, I can say they've only been successful in one of these three. Uh, first is to reduce the demand. Uh, they were saying, let's uh, look at uh, the efficiency of instruments and make them more efficient. Uh, let's not put every instrument out there. Let's have a set of instruments we move around. Uh, but let's develop alternatives. So that was a big push, was to develop alternative technologies, which I'll talk about. On this managed side, the first thing they declared is there shall be no more helium-3 for portal monitors. Well, fortunately, by 2010, uh, 
we at PNNL had deployed almost all the portal monitors at the US borders. So our demand for helium-3 had dra dramatically been reduced. So this has been sort of painful, but uh, not critical uh, in terms of Homeland Security. Um, the DOE said they're gonna put high priority on, on unique properties of helium-3. And in particular, they were going to be sure that they took advantage of their major investments. That is the Office of Science built this Belation neutron source. They wanted to be sure it had what it needed. <laughs> and then on the increased supply side, they talked about doing various things, uh, improving efficiency, finding other sources of helium-3. Uh, but in general, these have not come to pass. And I'll be saying a little bit more about that. So by 2014, Here's where the situation sat. There were two hypothetical situations. The first one at the top here was a situation where, where DOE was in around 2012 or so. They were selling off about 4,000 liters a year in an open auction. So in other words, they were selling to the public, which really meant they were selling to companies that made uh, helium-3 detectors about $4,000, 4,000 liters a year. And that included international sales. And they were providing about 10,000 liters a year to federal uses for, for helium-3. Um, under this scenario, you can see that they were saying, okay, we're gonna be out of helium-3 by 2024. So about now, we would have run out of the helium-3 supply. Um, since there was only about 8,000 liters a year being produced. The second hypothesis was sort of the drastic one. They were going to no longer sell off any helium-3. They were not going to provide any helium-3 for anybody except within the U.S. government, and they were going to restrict that use. And under that scenario, they said, okay, things look pretty good. The supply is going to be um, remaining constant, and we're going to be okay out to FY39. So that was in 2014. By 2016, they said, "Okay, great. You know, uh, we've we've reduced our demand to 2,000 liters a year, uh, and we've had some extra helium three come in. Uh, so uh, we're now looking, saying, oh, hey, the supply is going to grow over time, and so we no longer have a problem.' But they kept all the policies in place. So let me actually talk about this question about new supplies. One of the things that was looked into was can-do reactors. Can-do reactors use heavy water. And heavy water, you produce a lot of tritium inside that heavy water. Um, as you see on this list here, there are 17 active can-do reactors in Canada, but there are also four in Korea, several in India, 15 of them. Um, in Romania, in China, in Argentina, and Pakistan. Only in Canada does the do the reactor operators actually remove the tritium from the heavy water and store it. In these other countries, as far as I know, they just put the tritium up the stack, so they don't collect it. But in Canada, the Canada reactors, they do collect it, but they take that tritium and they put it onto titanium uh, beds uh, to store the tritium <clears throat> and let it decay. Uh, but these beds that were designed by GE Reuter Stokes for uh, can the Candu folks uh, were never designed to remove the helium-3. That is, they're sealed systems, and they were not designed to get the helium-3 out. So there were lots of discussions between the U.S. government, between uh, private industry, and uh, uh, between national labs and the Canadians about, hey, is there a way for us to get the helium-3. Um, but it turned out that Ontario Power, which is a private company, uh, was very reluctant to do that. Uh, partly, of course, because the US is a nuclear weapons state, um, but also because they didn't want to have the liability of the possibility of a lot of tritium escaping. Um, so anyway, can do reactors at the, that time, uh, didn't nothing worked out there. Uh, what about other possibilities? Well, the primordial abundance of helium-3 is about 140 parts per million. So it's pretty rare. 
Uh, the atmospheric abundance on the Earth of helium-3 is about 1.4 parts per million. Uh, so in principle, you might be able to get it out of the air. It turns out that about one in 500 fissions produces a triton. Uh, so there may be a source there. We get all of our helium in the US, our helium-4, from natural gas wells, uh, mostly in Colorado and New Mexico. Um, and in that natural gas, there's about 0.2 part per million of helium-3 present. So in principle, you could get out the helium and then somehow separate the helium-3 out of the helium-4. Uh, if you went out into space, the solar wind has about 480 parts per million. And then, of course, I mentioned the moon. The moon has about 0.05 parts per million helium-3 helium in it. And of course, it has helium-4 as well. So let me bring you up to date, 2022. Uh, there's a war going on. And so the Russian supply of, of helium-3 has ceased to be available due to the Ukraine war and sanctions. At this point, it turns out that federal demand for helium-3 now equals the supply. So that optimistic view that was held in 2016 is not true. Uh, the demand is actually high enough that, uh, that uh, there is still a problem. Um, there have been industry discussions about recovery from reactors. Uh, NASA has is looking into a long-term moon supply as a possibility, but there has been progress with CANDU. It turns out that Air Liquid has entered a long-term agreement with Laurentis Energy Partners, which run the Darlington CANDU reactor to produce and distribute helium-3. So maybe we will see helium-3 coming from Canada at last. But the really big change is this last here. You've heard about quantum computing. Well, it turns out to do quantum computing, you have to have a dilution refrigerator because you have to get down to millikelvin temperatures. So suddenly there is a new large demand for helium-3 because there's a demand for dilution refrigerators. So the helium-3 problem has not really gone away. So now let me turn to alternatives. If you can't have helium-3, what do you do? So if we talk about uh, alternative uh, neutron detectors, we can talk about uh, proportional counters or scintillators or semiconductors. Uh, proportional counters like helium-3 detectors can be filled with uh, boron trifluoride, which is a gas, uh, boron also has a large neutron cross-section, and boron trifluoride was actually used before helium-3 for neutron detection, so it's uh, certainly possible. As an alternative to using the gas, you can line the inside of the tubes with boron, uh, a boron solid and have a proportional gas there and detect neutrons that way. For scintillators, you can build several different configurations. You can uh, coat wavelength shifting fibers or paddles with a, uh, a neutron uh, simulating material. Um, you can put lithium glass, lithium into glass to make fibers or solids. Uh, you can make crystalline materials like click. Uh, you can use fast, uh, you can use liquid, liquid simulators for fast neutron detection. Uh, for solid state detectors, semiconductor detectors, um, you can make configurations with high intrinsic efficiency, but they typically are limited in size. Uh, you can actually uh, use high purity germanium and embed materials in that. You can use silicon. You can use boron uh, carbide or gallium arsenide. Uh, and we at PNNL tested quite a number of uh, alternative technologies uh, back several years ago, uh, looking at some of these alternatives. So let me talk more specifically about boron-10 based alternatives. Uh, boron-10 is about 19% of natural boron. Um, boron trifluoride, as I said, is perfectly good uh, proportional gas instead of helium-3. The cross section is about 70% of helium-3, so that's pretty good. But there's a problem in that you cannot put more than about one atmosphere of boron trifluoride into a proportional counter and make it work. And the reason is the gas tends to be electronegative and the electrons don't make it to the, to the central wire for amplification. So the result of low, at, low pressure plus this 70% means the efficiency is significantly less than a helium-3 tube. 
Uh, helium-3 tubes are typically three atmospheres or, or even more. In addition, boron trifluoride is a corrosive and poisonous gas. And so this produces shipping problems and it also runs into deployment problems. For example, Customs and Border Protection says you are not allowed to put boron trifluoride detectors at borders. So if you can't use a gas, what about a solid? So you can use a solid or on uh, solid and put it on the lining of a tube where the boron absorbs the neutrons and then the reaction produced uh, the when a neutron when a boron 10 absorbs a neutron it produces an alpha particle and a lithium 7 particle so one of those two particles enters the gas gives you a signal and uh, you can detect that signal fr from the neutron absorption uh, these things can be perfectly safe. The boron is a solid. The pressures inside these tubes are less than an atmosphere, so it's not a problem. But if you look at the energy spectrum that you get from a boron-lined tube, you get this stair-shaped structure. You remember for helium-3, you had a big peak out here that was well separated uh, from, the, from noise at the bottom. This boron uh, signal is not well separated from the bottom. Uh, and this bump here represents uh, the two the two uh, structures coming out of the the uh, the boron uh, decay, the alpha or the lithium. So just looking at a portional counter to remind you, portional counter is a tube filled with a gas. There's a wire running down the middle with a high voltage on it. If a neutron comes in and hits and hit, is absorbed by a helium three nucleus. It breaks up into a triton and a proton. Those two particles are then attracted. Uh, the, the electrons produced by those ionization from those two particles are attracted to the positive anode. When they get, get within one wire radi radius, uh, they are amplified and produce a signal that's you know, amplified about a factor of 10 to the fifth, or can be that high. And that gives you a, a pulse. For a boron line tube, the reaction occurs on the surface of the tube. A neutron is absorbed. It produces an alpha particle and lithium-7. One of those two particles goes into the gas. The other one goes into the wall because they're back to back. Again, the ionization produces electrons. The electrons go to the wire and produce an amplification. So that's how a tube, a tube works. So again, looking at the signal, here's the helium-3 signal you got with the full energy. And here's the boron line signal, uh, which can consists of a couple parts, as I showed. Uh, if you have to put a threshold down here, you end up losing a significant part of the signal, whereas you put a threshold down here on helium-3, and you don't lose very much. The bottom of these plots shows that uh, the it shows the gamma ray sensitivity of these tubes. Uh, both. BF3 and helium-3 are pretty good at rejecting gamma rays, but when you get up to high doses like 400 MR per hour, uh, you can get a significant background. This is the neutron hump, and, out, and down here are the gamma rays coming in. BF3 is actually slightly better than helium-3. Here's the helium-3 peak, and again, here's the uh, gamma rays with a 400 MR per hour signal coming in here pretty close to that peak. If you look at lithium alternatives, lithium-6 absorbs a neutron and yields an alpha particle and a triton. Uh, what's typically done is to mix uh, this lithium with uh, some scintillator. Uh, in the first case, lithium was put into lithium into silicate glass with cerium as a dopant, a fluorescent. Uh, this was done back in the mid 90s by Mary Bliss at PNL. Uh, over here are shown the fibers, uh, the scintillating fibers. These were built into a number of um, products and were actually sold commercially. Uh, so that's one way to use solid scintillators for neutron detection. Another way is to put uh, mix, mix lithium fluor fluoride with zinc sulfide so that the Neutrons absorbed on the lithium produces charged particles. Those charged particles produce scintillation in the zinc sulfide. And then you collect that light using a either a fiber optic or a panel. And I'll show you a picture here. Uh, here's a mixture of lithium-6 and zinc sulfide. 
It's surrounded by a plastic light guide. The plastic brings the signal to a PMT, uh, which then gives you a signal. Uh, shown here on the right is a commercial product made by Symmetrica. Uh, there's a moderator on the outside, and then inside that is some zinc sulfide mixed with lithium-6 to produce a signal, and there are phototubes on the ends. And here's a system that we built at PNNL um, that uh, was used for uh, neutron detection. I'll actually show you where this was used in a little while. Here's the pieces. Here's the, the white is the lithium-6 zinc sulfide, and the, the yellow is the wavelength shifting plastic. So now let me talk about alternatives for safeguards. Shown here on the top is a simulation model of that uncle I showed you previously. You see the whole series of helium-3 tubes in a moderator uh, with an active source here that would, act, would bombard neutrons on fuel shown here in the middle. So uh, as I mentioned that uh, the IEA uses gross counting and coincidence counting and multiplicity counting. There are four common coincidence counters used, the underwater coincidence counter used underwater, as you might expect, an active well coincidence counter, a high level neutron coincidence counter, and the uncle, uranium neutron coincidence collar. So we worked on developing an alternative based uncle. Uh, I'll also mention uh, an epithermal neutron multiplicity counter that's used. So here's that uncle I showed you earlier uh, with a fuel bundle, in, a fresh fuel bundle inside it in an active configuration. The uncle comes in two forms. One is for pressurized water reactor fuel and the other is for boiling water reactor fuel. And these yellow circles here, this is looking at from the top. <clears throat> these are the helium three counters in, in a typical un uncle. And this is the passive mode where there is no active source present. So the fuel goes in here and you detect the singles and doubles neutrons in these helium-3 tubes. So now here's a model showing an alternative uncle. This one is based on boron line tubes. These are boron line tubes made by GE Reuter Stokes. They're one inch diameter. Um, they're filled with a P10 basically gas mixture. Uh, the, the two different colors are, are different uh, uh, thicknesses of boron, it turns out. They did two different layers of boron, two different uh, thicknesses of boron in this detector. But you can see how many more tubes are involved, how many more proportional counters are involved in making this alternative uncle as compared to the previous one. Let me go back. You can see there's how many tubes are used for helium-3, and now more than two to three times uh, as many tubes for, for the boron line counter. That's in order to get the efficiency up. Even so, the efficiency of this uncle is not as high as that of the standard uncle. So we took this detector that GE bought with our collaboration. We took it to Los Alamos and tested it on some fuel elements that Los Alamos has. Uh, so here's an, the experimental setup with the mock-up fuel element. And these are some of the different configurations of fuel that we looked at, mixtures of LEU and uh, in blue and uh, DU, depleted uranium in, uh, in black. Uh, so just different configurations to look at uh, these. Uh, it turned out the efficiency was 9.6% and the dead time was 920 nanoseconds. Um, so, something less than a microsecond. Um, let me go back to a second. So, so from this, you can determine what's called the uh, figure of merit. And I don't actually show the number here, but the figure of merit is this number, the efficiency squared divided by this dead time. Let me compare the uncle now to the epithermal neutron um, multiplicity counter. Uh, this is a large detector, a very expensive detector built by Los Alamos. It's a very large moderator material with a whole lot of helium-3 tubes in it. And by the way, you know, every single helium-3 tube has an, a preamplifier on it. And those preamplifiers tend to be pretty expensive. Uh, and the data acquisition associated with this is pretty complex. 
But anyway, this is a highly efficient detector. It measures multiplicity. That is, it measures singles, doubles, and triples. It has 121 helium-3 tubes. Uh, and it has a figure merit of 186. So that's an efficiency of 65%. Again, compare that to the uncle at 9.6%. And it has a di die away time of 23 microseconds compared to less than a microsecond for the uncle, the alternative uncle. So you can see that this figure merit is much, much bigger than that from uh, the alternative uncle, or actually even from the uncle itself. Um, but this is only used at a few facilities because it is large and expensive and complex and can break as well. Uh, but it is able to do multiplicity detection, which gives you very good characterization of the material being examined. So we worked on an alternative-based ENMC. This was based on zinc sulfide mixed with lithium-6 uh, fluoride with wavelength shifting uh, plastic. I showed you earlier a picture of those materials being built. Those detectors are inside of these aluminum cases, which form a square. And you can see in this drawing here, the square, this is how the square is supposed to look like. There's here are the detectors inside, mounted inside the aluminum case, surrounding the material being assayed here. Um, and I don't, again, show the uh, figure merit here, but I can simply tell you that the figure merit was acceptable, but nowhere near as good as the ENM, ENMC uh, by maybe an order of magnitude. And this translates into much longer measurement times, which uh, is a problem as far as the IEA is concerned in terms of making measurements. So I would say it is possible to make alternative instruments, alternative uncles, alternative multiplicity counters, but it's challenging to actually use these in, in the environment where inspectors actually have to do their work. So let me just conclude all of this by saying that uh, there are lots of radiation detectors used for safeguards routinely by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, alternative neutron detectors have been developed and tested for safeguards applications. Uh, as far as I know, the IEA is not currently using any alternative-based systems. They're still using helium-3-based systems. Um, one of the things is muons may play a role in the future. I think you've seen the work uh, that's been done on storage cask imaging. So they may play a future role. Uh, you know about the anti-neutrino work that's been done, um, investigated for use in safeguards. It seems like that's pretty unlikely to be applied because of its expense and large detectors being used, but maybe it's possible. Uh, and then there's the, the new challenges I'll point out uh, for the IEA. Uh, because of new, new small modular reactors, we're gonna see a lot more reactors, which complicates inspection. We're gonna see more countries with nuclear power. We're gonna see new types of fuel, which again complicates measurements by the IEA. And we're going to see new reactor cycles, which may require more frequent uh, measurements by the IEA. So with that, let me say uh, thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions you have. Thank you very much, Dr. Cruzes. Um, now we'll open the floor for questions. Um, uh, we have a Q&A option online, um, or if you want to, um, speak up, uh, just raise your hand, and I'll be able to see you in attendees, and I can allow you to talk. Um, but yeah, any questions in the room first? So if I can get it started. Yeah, Lonnie. Yeah, thanks again for the talk. Um, one thing I was hoping you could just comment on a little bit was, especially as we start to consider these alternative detection techniques that are lower efficiency, what does the IAEA consider an acceptable measurement time? Like what threshold would they ideally be looking for with these technologies? Well, so ideally, uh, the instruments would have the same measurements time as previous instruments. So, you know, times like 15 minutes, uh, you know, or less per measurement. Um, with alternatives, that's challenging. It's That's not to say it's not possible. It may be possible to make instruments that uh, that are more efficient, but it's certainly challenging to make alternative-based systems uh, that have the the efficiency, the sensitivity, 
the decay times and all those parameters that uh, make an instrument usable. Um, but in the end, uh, they may have to accept uh, fewer measurements as a result of longer time measurement times. Thank you. Yeah, Leandro. Uh, well, I have a question about the sources uh, for heavy uh, free. And uh, what are the main challenges uh, of adapting cannula type reactors for uh, producing L3? Like mean, uh, technical reactor uh, challenges or I don't know economical challenges. Uh, you're saying the challenges with the smaller modular reactors? And no, no. Uh, sorry. Um, the challenges of adapting candle reactors or heavy water reactors in general to produce helium free. Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> so the first thing is that the, the reactor operator has to collect the tritium. Uh, like I said, in Canada, that's done. Uh, the Canadian reactors are run by private companies. Uh, so they are wary of liability. They are wary of sharing material with weapons states. Uh, so, and that's been, so that was the problem back in, you know, 2010. You know, we, we PNNL, talked to them about Helium-3. Uh, the U.S. government, uh, DOE, talked directly with them about helium three, but they were basically unwilling to do it because of, uh, you know, the neighbor, the neighborhoods around reactors are sensitive about what goes on. And so, uh, you know, how would this be processed? You know, how can you guarantee you're not going to release tritium and so forth? Um, we, I had actually inquired about, you know, maybe India with a lot of candu reactors would be willing to do this, but uh, there didn't seem to be any interest in the U.S., uh, government infrastructure into looking into that question, again, because India is a weapon state, and so there are issues surrounding that. I might mention that currently the IEA does not have regulations related to tritium. You know, that is, they have a significant quantity of plutonium, a significant quantity of HEU, but not for tritium. Um, so that is something that probably they have to address in the future. Um, but anyway, uh, that's why it's, you know, as I mentioned, it's fortunate that now a Canadian company is apparently working with the Darlington can do reactor facility uh, to, to do something with their, their tritium. Once you collect the tritium out of the water, and by the way, to do that, <laughs> it's a non-trivial thing. So they actually take the water from the can do reactors, they ship it off to another facility where it's, where it's repurified. Uh, and uh, because you have to, you have to, you know, get the tritium away from the deuterium. Uh, so it's a non-trivial process to get the tritium out. And then once you do that, you put the tritium onto a bed. Uh, like I said, you make titanium tritide uh, on a in a container, and then you wait a while for the helium three to to decay. You know, the tr tritium to decay and the helium three to grow in, and then you milk that as a as a source to get the, the helium three out, but not get the tritium out. And so there's concerns about, you know, when you do that milking, you don't want to release any tritium. So that's again, part of the concern by the private industry about the liabilities. So anyway, it's, it's not a cheap or, or easy process to just go do it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kuzas. We have a couple of questions online um, and then I think that will bring us to the end of the talk. Um, first one is from Professor He. He asks, what's the limiting factor on the lower figure merit on PNNL's multi neutron multiplicity counter, the, I believe the last one you explained, um, compared to LANL's helium 3 based system? Mm -hmm. Good question. So, you know, basically, um, you, if, you, if you capture a neutron in a helium 3 detector, you have 100% efficiency, right? You know, uh, so, so helium three based systems can be designed with you know ninety percent or ninety some percent efficiency for capturing neutrons. Um, in the in the uh, boron based system, you have a lot more detectors to put in because uh, the capture efficiencies are lower. Uh, the the noise from uh, gamma rays or uh, limit your threshold, so you have to throw away. Uh, a 
significant piece of the low energy part, part of the pulses coming out of the detector. So that's, that's part of the reason for the PNL figure merit being poor, but also because uh, we didn't want to spend the money to put in you know, multiple layers of detectors, which would have been necessary to bulk boost that efficiency up. Even so, I don't think we ever could have reached an ENMC uh, type of efficiency, but you could get certainly a lot better than we, than we did. So limitations of, uh, of money in implementation and in the basic uh, detector capabilities. Thanks, Dr. Pulis. Um, last one here is from Professor Coetzee. Um, she said, thanks for the talk. Um, can you say more about the IEA's liquid scintillation counter for fresh fuel verification? Okay, I'm not I'm not sure I know exactly what that's referring to, but uh, so it is possible to look at fast neutrons coming from fission instead of thermalizing them. Um, the challenge there is the high rates, as I understand it, discriminating the the neutrons from the gamma ray background, which there is uh, uh, some. and uh, and then so you basically do multiplicity analysis on the fast neutrons as detected. And like I said, I think the difficulty there is the discrimination of gamma rays and neutrons. Uh, but I'm not absolutely sure that's you know the whole story. Yeah, fair enough, Dr. Kuzis. I think we have some expertise here with the liquid scintillation counters. Um, yeah, I, the last question for me, you know, um, we have experimented with these organic scintillators on campus. Um, and in fact, have proven with measurements, um, decent time to assay on coincident measurements with a organic scintillator well counter configuration. Um, do you see um, more factors that could go into that figure there? Um, since we showed um, with organic scintillators, um, good time to assay, like on a scale of four minute time to assay for a plutonium benchmark. Yeah, I think that's good. I mean, uh, you know, the the, the new scintillator materials like you're using are faster, I think, than the liquids, aren't they, in terms of pulse length? Yeah, slightly faster, um, about scale of uh, a couple hundred you know, seconds versus uh, three to 400. Okay, yeah, so I mean, the faster faster timing gives you some, some advantage there in terms of uh, pileup projection and pulse shape projection. Uh, if you could come up with something even faster, that would be better. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Or sorry, Dr. Kuzis. Um, I think that's it for questions, um, but we'll be putting this recording online. I'll send the link to you afterwards. And thank you again so much for your talk. Um, can you give me a round of, another round of applause, please? We'll, well be thank, logging you. Off. thank you. I appreciate uh, being able to speak with you. Have a good afternoon. You too. See you around. Bye.